Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. These are our main stories. Israel has confirmed that one of its aircraft struck an ambulance in Gaza. It says it was being used by Hamas fighters. The Palestinians say a medical convoy was hit twice, causing many casualties. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pledges there will be no pause in the fighting until all hostages are released. The leader of the Lebanese armed group Hezbollah says the conflict could widen if Israel's attacks on Gaza don't cease. Also in this podcast, the skulls of four 19th century indigenous warriors from Taiwan are being returned by a Scottish university. Most of the skulls we hold will not be from individuals who wanted their skulls to come to the university. They were collected without their consent. And too hot to trot, how a tarantula caused a traffic accident in Death Valley. In Gaza, ambulances have come under fire with the Israelis saying it hit one, killing Hamas fighters it says were using the vehicle to move weapons near an area of battle. Hamas accuses the Israelis of targeting a convoy of ambulances leaving the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza City and in the process killing a large number of people. A spokesperson for the Hamas-run health ministry said that wounded Palestinians in the vehicles were being moved from Gaza City towards the border with Egypt. Bizanada, a filmmaker and journalist, was at the hospital. A warning, you may find what you're about to hear distressing. It's a massacre. Thousands of people are out. Thousands of people. Thousands. <laughs> These people lose their homes. They are, they are evacuating to Shifa. They are sitting outside because there is no place in the Shifa. They, they bombed the place outside. They bombed the, the door. I've been there just before two minutes. It could be me. <laughs> On Friday, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, was in Israel, pressing for a pause in the fighting so more aid reaches civilians. But the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, rejected any such pause and repeated his demand that Hamas release the hostages it abducted last month, at least 240 of them, according to officials in Israel. We are continuing with all our strength, and Israel is refusing a temporary truce that doesn't include the release of our hostages. Israel will not enable the entry of fuel into Gaza and opposes transferring money to the Strip. As the conflict in Gaza continues, the Hamas-run health ministry in the territory said that more than 9,200 people had been killed since Hamas massacred 1,400 people in Israel. I got the latest about Gaza from our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams, who's in Jerusalem. That was certainly very upsetting footage. And, you know, we've seen an awful lot of that in the last few days, Valerie. There were bodies lying on the ground next to uh, ambulances. Clearly, some of the people we could see were dead. Others were very badly wounded. Now, it wasn't at all clear what was going on there. And there was some suggestion that uh, there was an attempt to mount some kind of convoy to take wounded people down south, out, out of harm's way, and that some kind of projectile, a missile possibly launched from a drone, landed nearby, perhaps in an attempt to stop this convoy. uh, And as a result, uh, we saw these injuries. Now, the Israelis haven't talked about that incident, but they have put out a statement tonight, which appears to describe maybe a separate incident in which they say that a number of Hamas operatives Uh, were killed and they say that it was an attempt to use an ambulance to transport Hamas gunmen from one location to another and that that was why it was struck. So whether these two relate to the same episode or two different episodes, I'm afraid to say it's not at all clear. Now, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has been in Israel and indeed in Jordan. Do you think his trip increases the chances of a humanitarian pause in exchange for more aid and indeed the release of the hostages? Well, I think that's certainly what he would like to achieve. And you can you can sense a slight upping of the pressure from the United States on Israel 
to to achieve something like that you know this is not a ceasefire this is you know what they are what they are calling a humanitarian pause ba- basically brief breaks in the fighting so that aid can get in to where it's needed and possibly also to buy time and space for hostage negotiations now at the moment anthony blinken says that there's you know the, there are discussions going on there are mechanisms being discussed we have not heard from uh, the pre- israeli prime minister benjamin netanyahu any obvious sign of a willingness to go down this route and in fact there on one specific issue today there was a clear disagreement and that is on the question of fuel because uh, the us has said and and mr blinken was saying this that they're trying to identify mechanisms to get fuel into the southern part of the gaza strip uh, where it's badly needed for hospitals and for the aid agencies to to, to move aid around the, the the southern gaza strip but uh, the prime minister benjamin netanyahu has said that he is adamantly opposed to all fuel go- going into gaza uh, the israeli view is that all of that ends up in the hands of hamas paul adams in jerusalem Well, until Friday, we hadn't heard from the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, about the Lebanese Islamist group's reaction to the conflict in Gaza. But now he's given a televised speech saying the only way to prevent a regional war is for Israel to stop attacking Gaza. And all options on the Lebanese front, he says, are open. Here is Hassan Nasrallah on the attack by Hamas on Israel on October the 7th. This is the first operation which has been a historic point and and blessed point. This was a Palestinian decision, 100% and supported by the Palestinians, 100%. Ahead of the speech, the army in Israel had been on what they termed a very, very high alert. I got the latest from Hugo Bachega on Lebanon's border with Israel. All eyes were on the speech by Hassan Nasrallah, the first time he uh, gave a public speech since the beginning of this war between Israel and Gaza. And again, he said all options are on the table, that the only way to prevent the war from spreading across the region is to stop the conflict in Gaza. He said Hezbollah's actions would be determined by what happens in Gaza and also by Israel's actions towards Hezbollah and Lebanon. So very important points. But I think what is also important is that he did not uh, give any indication that the group is preparing a massive escalation of the violence that is happening along the border. So I think that's very important. I think people here in Lebanon tonight are relieved. I think, uh, you know, lots of people were very concerned that, uh, you know, he could perhaps announce a a massive escalation in this offensive by Hezbollah against uh, Israeli targets. And obviously the fear here is that this could uh, drag Lebanon into this conflict. And what's happening on the border now? So we've seen that for weeks Hezbollah has been uh, carrying out these cross-border attacks targeting uh, Israeli positions. Israel has been retaliating. And I think the underlying fear is that this could escalate and, and this could become you know, another front in this conflict. We've heard from Israeli officials, from American officials who've been warning Hezbollah against escalating the situation, promising a devastating uh, response if they decided to do so. Hugo Bacheca. Hundreds of foreign passport holders have now been able to leave Gaza through the Rafah crossing into Egypt, including British Palestinian doctor Abdul Qadir Hamad. He was cleared for passage through the border but was turned away on Wednesday. On Thursday, he tried again, this time successfully, and travelled to the airport in Cairo for a flight to London. Anita Anand asked him about his experience. We were out by 11.30 to the Egyptian side. But then we were holed up in no man's land for four, four and a half hours, waiting for the Egyptians to allow us into their arrivals hall. Mm. My understanding, there was a standoff between the Egyptians and the Israelis regarding entry of ambulances from Gaza to Egypt. And they have stopped us as part of the negotiations between the parties. What was it like? And did you have water, food? And what was it like in No Man's Land? Okay, there isn't really any uh, uh, water or... I mean, you can buy water, but there isn't food. Very crowded area. There are a lot of people there. 
and chaotic. There is no system to see who is going, who is not going. And a lot of people are trying, obviously, to leave Gaza, but there are names which has been listed to be evacuated, but and these are only the internationals yesterday when we left. So at the Egyptian side, we entered about 4.30. We were processed inside their terminal. It's also a lot of people are chaotic. And then we were finished by 7 o'clock and we boarded the bus to Cairo and arrived this this morning at 4 o'clock. And what was the reception like in, in Cairo? In fact, I mean, I have to say here that I was pleased to see the officials from the British government at the crossing in Rafa, and they arranged our transport to Cairo and the hotel in Cairo. Um, now that you are in Cairo, I mean, I wonder if it's actually hit home with you that you are out and you are safe. Oh, I'm hugely relieved that I am out. They are my colleagues, my patients who are in a terrible situation. A lot of them, I think, will die because of there's no medications, no dialysis. And that breaks my heart. And now that you are out of that place, I mean, would you have a message to those who have authority in this country? What would you tell them? I mean, they, I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm a doctor. And my duty is to save lives. And I think there are unnecessary waste of a human life in this conflict. Mostly they are the civilians, the children, the those who are not involved in the conflict directly. And they need to look into that. This is a humanitarian disaster at a scale which I don't think has been seen before. Dr. Abdul Qadir Hamad speaking there to Anita Anand. Other news now. It's the first trip to a Commonwealth country since the start of their reign. And now the British royals, King Charles and Queen Camilla, have completed their four-day state visit to Kenya in the coastal city of Mombasa. The king met interfaith leaders at the Memorial Cathedral there, while the queen was given a warm welcome when she met survivors of domestic violence. Earlier, King Charles was shown how the authorities are trying to conserve marine habitats and the coral reef. As our senior Africa correspondent Anne Soy explains, the environment has been a key feature of this tour. Every step of the way, there was an element of environmental conservation. As soon as he arrived in Nairobi during the official welcome on Tuesday morning, he planted a tree at State House and he went on to plant several other trees during his visit. And in the coastal city of Mombasa, he met conservationists from a community, marine conservationists. And I have just seen a picture of him and the Queen posing inside an electric tuk-tuk, which he was meant to ride in to historic Fort Jesus. But uh, the weather hasn't been very friendly today. But this visit was about celebrating the areas of cooperation between Britain and Kenya. It's also about a reflection of the past. And there are elements of the past that are not very comfortable, which the king, for the first time, a reigning monarch, brought them up, expressing deep sorrow and regret for the atrocities committed by the colonial government during the emergency period in the 1950s. He also met uh, some of the surviving family members of heroes who are recognized in Kenya as having led their different communities from the coast to central Kenya and the Rift Valley to oppose colonial settlement. So it was something different, something that has been welcomed here. Uh, However, there have been criticisms that the king should have gone further to actually offer an apology for that. But that, we understand, is something that government ministers would need to make a decision on. And soy. And staying in Kenya, the Ogiek people are one of the last indigenous forest communities to survive in the country. But now the rights group Survival International says the authorities there are brutally evicting them from their ancestral land. Survival says forest rangers and the police are forcibly pushing out up to 700 Ogiek from their homes in the Mao forest, all in the name of conservation. Our Africa regional editor Richard Hamilton has been following the story. 
Well, let's stay in Kenya because one of the country's minority communities, the Ogiek, is marking a year since the African Court of Justice ruled in their favour. The Ogiek people have had a long history of run-ins with the government in Nairobi. In 2017, a court found that the Kenyan administration had violated the rights of the Ogiek, who have lived in the forest for centuries as hunter-gatherers and famous beekeepers. But over the years, the Mao forest in the Rift Valley has seen human encroachment and environmental degradation, threatening the future of Kenya's main water catchment area. From the 1920s, the British colonial administration evicted many Ogiek communities to create game parks and forest reserves. Survival International says these current evictions go against several court rulings. Fiore Longo is their campaign manager. Rangers from the Kenyan Forestry Service and the Kenyan Wildlife Service are evicting up to 700 Ogiek people. They're hunter-gatherers. They depend on the forest for living and they're being evicted from their forest in the name of conservation. Their house are being destroyed with hammers and axes or sometimes they're burning. The rangers are burning the houses. So people are being just sent away. We are talking about pregnant women, about children, about elders, that they don't have any other place to go. And it's raining and it's cold and they are suffering a lot. Some Ogiek people say these evictions are related to carbon credits that the government in Nairobi promoted at the recent Africa Climate Summit. It comes as King Charles finishes a royal visit to Kenya, potentially embarrassing both for the Kenyan president, William Ruto, and the British monarch. Richard Hamilton. The remains of four tribal warriors killed nearly 150 years ago are being repatriated from Scotland to their indigenous community in Taiwan. The Taiwanese fighters were killed during a Japanese attack on the south of the island in 1874 with their heads taken as trophies and the skulls came into the possession of Edinburgh University in 1907. Our Scotland correspondent Laura Gordon reports. In an Edinburgh building devoted to academia, a traditional ceremony led by a shaman from the Mudan community in the south of Taiwan. The shaman is summoning the ancestral spirits of four tribal warriors killed by the Japanese almost 150 years ago. Their skulls, which were taken as trophies of war, eventually ended up in the anatomical collection at the University of Edinburgh. The collection, which contains more than 1,700 skulls, is considered globally significant and is used for research into the history of genetics, diet and the movement of people. Tom Gillingwater, who's the university's professor of anatomy, says the institution has a long-held policy to return remains when asked and where provenance can be identified. Most of the skulls we hold will not be from individuals who wanted their skulls to come to the university. They were collected without their consent. A um, large part of that does come from the colonial uh, reaches. Uh, and this is really part of our efforts to understand that history and where appropriate to then try and make amends and return ancestral remains to their individual peoples, in this case to the Mudan tribe in Taiwan. This is the first time Taiwan has made a request for remains to be returned. They will now go to their homeland, where a permanent resting place will now be found. Lorna Gordon. Still to come on this podcast, the hidden costs of cancer treatment for children in Uganda. My mom and dad were farmers. They didn't have enough money for buying food and for transport to go back home. I almost stopped my cancer treatment last year. It was so bad. But before we move on, let's get news of today's Happy Pot with Andrew Peach. Yes, there's a musical theme this week with a Ukrainian refugee who wrote a piece of music to cheer up a colleague which then went viral. Also, the band that walked between scores of their gigs carrying their instruments on their backs. There's news from Brazil of a vaccine for cocaine addiction, a new type of seal in Greenland... And two incredible young people, a six-year-old girl in China who can do a Rubik's Cube in six seconds and a 17-year-old robotics expert from India who could transform the lives of people with Parkinson's disease. Join me, Andrew Peach, for half an hour of uplifting news in the Happy Pod in this feed every Saturday. Thanks, Andrew. We look forward to that. (laughs) 
Italy has had almost 70 governments since World War II, more than twice the number in Britain and Germany. Repeated attempts to produce a more robust system have failed. But now the current Prime Minister, Giorgia Meloni, has backed a proposal on constitutional reform. In a news conference, she explained her reasons. To guarantee that those who are elected by the people can govern with a clear time frame for the legislature, which makes sure that there is stability for the government, which will have five years to put its projects into practice. This will guarantee a stability which is essential for the credibility of the government, both on a national and international level. Our correspondent, Danny Eberhard, told me more about the proposals. Well, the main thing, Val, is that there would be a direct election for the prime minister and the person would get five years in power, which in Italian terms is a lifetime, really. Since the Second World War, governments have lasted on average a little over a year and a month. As she mentioned in that clip, getting a legislative programme together that actually has some sort of long-term planning is very difficult in Italy. And that's why, for example, she's talked about credibility on an international stage, because some countries say, well, you're prime minister of Italy at the moment, but who's going to be prime minister a year down the line. So another important thing is the party or the coalition that backs the candidate for the prime minister that actually wins the election would get a majority of seats nationwide in parliament. That level hasn't been fixed yet, but they're suggesting a minimum level of 55% of the seats. So that would be a transformative event for the Italian political system. And there's other aspects to it. So you couldn't make a technocratic government. So the sort of government we we saw with Mario Draghi in power before uh, Miss Maloney took over between 2021 and 2022, which have been used sometimes to carry on a legislative programme, for example, things like spending coronavirus funds, when there isn't actually a clear majority in the Italian parliament. Often some of the more successful governments have indeed been technocratic governments. The end to backroom deals, it's an end to the what the Italians call ribaldoni, which are the situations where in an unstable coalition, one party would change allegiance and undermine the whole government and also it would change the the powers of the presidency. They say presidency in his or her role would stay the same but actually the president's power is clearest when there is not a majority and when the, the president appoints prime ministers and for example blocks cabinet appointments, things like that. But any change in the constitution needs to secure a two-thirds majority, doesn't it, in both houses of parliament. So is this going to happen? Currently, the governing coalition, it's a right-wing coalition of Miss Maloney, does command majorities in both houses, but doesn't command the two-thirds majority. For a constitutional change to take place, if the legislation goes through houses with a majority, it can then go to a public referendum. And that's really where this thing is going to be tested. Clearly, some in the political opposition oppose it. They fear that this might be some sort of power grab from Miss Maloney. There's also a period before it even gets voted on where it may change in committee stage. So this proposal is very much a first step and we'll see where we're at a few months down the line. Danny Eberhard. A leading expert on artificial intelligence has said it could be some time before advances in the technology remove the need for people to work, despite an ambitious prediction from the tech millionaire Elon Musk. Following this week's AI Safety Summit and during an interview with Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister, Mr Musk said artificial intelligence would one day take over all jobs. But Professor Dame Wendy Hall, who was the UK's first artificial intelligence skills champion, has her doubts. More from our technology editor, Zoe Kleinman. Elon Musk himself admitted that he wasn't sure whether people would be happy or sad about the demise of employment as we know it. He was in conversation with the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak at an event held in central London in front of a selected audience. Some journalists were invited but not allowed to ask questions. The computer scientist Professor Dame Wendy Hall said his prediction would leave humans in a strange situation. What does it mean to have a world without work? How will people be supported? Are we just going to become the biofuel for the matrix? These are all very hypothetical. And, you know, this whole debate about are we going to have an existential threat from AI? I borrow these lines from Sir Adrian Smith, the president of the Royal Society, who just says, not in my lifetime. Elon Musk's forecast also contradicted the Prime Minister's messages about the impact of AI on jobs. He's been careful to build the tech as a useful tool rather than a replacement and talked about new jobs springing up around it, much like the rise of the internet created new, previously unheard of roles. 
Zoe Kleinman. When a child has cancer, it takes its toll on their families. But when potentially life-saving treatment is available, but unaffordable, it can leave parents with heartbreaking decisions to make. It's estimated that a third of children suffering from cancer in East Africa have had to abandon treatment because of the cost. Often it's the hidden expenses of, say, travelling to hospitals and accommodation that add up to insurmountable expense. Our reporter Anna Komu has been to one charity-run hostel in the Ugandan capital Kampala, which is trying to help children with cancer and their families. It's a sunny day in Kampala. Children play board games in the yard of a hostel. But this is a hostel like no other. Children staying here have one important thing in common. They all have cancer. 14-year-old Dorcas Chirop is one of them. I was feeling pain. I cannot even play. I cannot even wash my own clothes. Dorcas had to travel to Kampala weekly to receive treatment. But her parents could not pay for accommodation near the hospital, which meant a grueling seven-hour journey from the home and back. My mom and dad were farmers. They didn't have enough money for buying food and for transport to go back home. I almost stopped my cancer treatment last year. It was so bad. In 2020, more than 3,000 children in Uganda were diagnosed with cancer, says the World Health Organization. Treatment is available, but those from poorer communities face huge challenges to access it. Dr. Joyce Balagade is the head of pediatric oncology at Uganda Cancer Institute in Kampala. 80-85% of the population of children with cancer here at the Cancer Institute are peasants who live on less than three dollars you know, a month. So, for example, here a diagnosis can be made for free. Chemotherapy is available at no cost to the patient. Surgery and radiotherapy attracts a small cost, but that can be wavered. Despite which, we have high treatment abandonment rates. And a lot of that has to do with uh, what we call the hidden costs that nobody ever thinks about. A number of clinics in Kampala are willing to cover the costs to treat childhood cancer. But low-income families who live far from the capital still have to pay for transport, accommodation and food while the treatment takes place. For many of them, the expense is too high. We had a very sorry situation with almost uh, 50% treatment abandonment rate because of this. And we ended up having a lot of low cases. Children who are around, you discharge them to come back three weeks later, but they have nowhere to go. So they and their families camp on the floor. Dorcas was lucky to find help. While completing her treatment, she stayed at a hostel run by Bless a Child Foundation. The charity offers free shelter for disadvantaged patients. Peter Genza is the director. The home provides accommodation, meals, transport to and from hospital and psychosocial support. Most of the families that we accommodate come from all over the country. They are poor people from rural communities and they cannot afford even the basics like the transport fare to bring them to town. For me, again, again. Over the past decade, more than 6,000 children in Uganda have received help from the Bless a Child charity. Dorcas was one of them. The teenager has now completed her cancer treatment. And even though she temporarily lost her hair because of chemotherapy, her spirits are high. Now I have finished the treatment. I feel like go back home, to go to school, to see my family. And that report from Anna Kumo. And let's return again to our main story, the conflict in Gaza. Let's hear a signal that residents of Gaza will have been able to hear from Friday. مستمعينا الكرام أهلا بكم إلى أولى حلقات برنامج غزة اليوم وفيها مراسل بي بي سي يقول إن قطاع غزة بات مفصولا إلى قسمين. And that is the sound of the BBC Arabic service which has begun daily radio broadcasts on medium wave that will provide the latest news to residents of Gaza including practical information about where to access vital services. The analogue signal will still work even when internet and phone connections are down.
The controller of languages at the BBC World Service, Tariq Kafala, said the radio service would broadcast vital information. We'll be broadcasting on medium wave from Cyprus. Obviously, the the program is a lifeline program, so it will include news updates and so on. But the main purpose will be to give information to the population of Gaza that will help them make good decisions about how to stay safe, how to access uh, water, health care and food um, that they need in this obviously desperate situation. Tariq Kafala. And finally, many of us have a fear of spiders. Few, though, have had such a devastating reaction to seeing one. The incident took place in the aptly named Death Valley National Park in the United States when a pair of Swiss tourists caught sight of a tarantula legging it across Route 190. Terry Egan reports. It's one of the hottest places on Earth. But around now is when tarantulas are out in the desert scouting for a mate. They take eight years or so to mature, one for each leg perhaps. But then, bang, they're off, and nothing was about to stop this one. Least of all, a rented camper van. All of which meant the van pulled up sharpish and a motorcycle crashed into the back of it, while its rider was transported to hospital. Tarantulas have poor sight. They move slowly and are not aggressive. They all 